Hey, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Rock Your Shine After You've Been Cracked Wide Open. I am very excited to introduce you to my guest this week, and her name is Gabby Nobrega. She is a mother of two. She has a 28-year-old son, Matthew, and a 22-year-old daughter, Hope. And she is the wife to her high school sweetheart. Uh, She's an entrepreneur who runs a communication agency, and she works with people and brands, and she is a powerful change agent. Gabby is going to be talking today about numerous losses that she's had in her life. She's had two miscarriages, one of which almost took her life, and she recently lost her mom in November. And so we will be talking today about what that journey has looked like for her and her family. Gabby, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So why don't we start from the beginning that you and I had an opportunity to talk about prior to recording the show. Talk to us about your the two miscarriages that you had. Well, the first, actually, I was First of all, looking to have a, a huge family. So I was thrilled to be pregnant. And the first, like so many women and families that experience a loss, there was some physical signs, if you will. And we were out camping and in the woods. And I lost the child and sort of went about our way camping. But at that point in time, I had a two-year-old. And my focus was on not letting him know that anything had happened. And I went back to work. It was a long weekend here in Canada, Labor Day weekend, ironically. And uh, I went back to work and on the following Tuesday was having a a miscarriage in a client's office. So I had to excuse myself, drove myself to the hospital, went through the typical procedure that one would. And, you know, mentally I was crushed and uh, just decided that I was going to put that behind me and try and get pregnant again. So before we jump to the next heroin experience that you had, You know, I think that miscarriages are one of those things that we don't talk enough about. I don't think that people actually understand the devastation that women go through and also their partners when they lose a child in utero. I had a woman, Kristen, that I interviewed a long time ago who really talked in depth about how she, she secretly or felt like she had to keep it a secret, her grieving. What was your experience when you said you kind of wanted to move on? Did you allow yourself to feel the loss of that child? I don't think consciously, truthfully. There's two things that weigh into that. My husband is European. Mm -hmm. He is very traditional. I don't think he was ever raised in an environment where one would take the time to grieve as an individual, as a man. And, and also grieve as a couple. So I think there's a bit of a cultural factor in this as well. I'm also just the type of person who I suppress oftentimes my grief. I think I'm doing that even right now with my mother's passing. I don't think I've really truly embraced what that really entails. So it, I think it's fair to say that I've always been the type of person who I acknowledge a situation, I sort of sit in it for a bit, but then the best way for me to sort of deal with it is to dust myself off, put the next foot in front of the other and just keep going. Well, and I think that that is pretty universal in our world. I mean, I certainly know I should say in the States, at least, and I know that you are in Canada, but in the States where, you know, most organizations give you three days of bereavement and then you are expected to go back to work. So I think that pull yourself up by your bootstraps and carry on, I think is pretty much, you know, the way that we live and operate in this world. Let's go to the second miscarriage, because I know that was, as I said earlier, almost took your life. How long, how long between those two pregnancies was there? Exactly a year. So I lost the first child in September. And then come August, I started to notice similar signs, was a little bit concerned because I thought, here we go again, phoned my physician, they did an ultrasound and the physician told me at the time that the baby had died. And my husband and I had a European cruise planned, never done one of those before. And I really needed to get away. I think the full force of wondering, you know, am I going to have a second child was really started to, to affect me. So we boarded a cruise ship in Mallorca, Spain, and we weren't on it for 12 hours where I started to hemorrhage. 
And I went into shock, actually. I wasn't able to feel parts of my body. So that's when I started to panic. They brought me down into the infirmary. I was very fortunate. There was a surgeon on board. His name was Dr. David Hilroyd. His name is seared into my mind. And I was immediately admitted. They started to do tests. And he then proceeded to tell me that I was second trimester pregnant. And he wanted to know. Can you explain what that Yeah. So he did a urine test the way you would do to find out you were pregnant. And I guess depending upon the tests are actually able to tell what stage you're at in terms of pregnancy. So he said, you're 13 weeks pregnant. I said, that's impossible. I had a miscarriage at eight weeks. I'm no longer pregnant. And he said, oh no, you're very much pregnant, which means you could have an ectopic twin or they were wrong with your diagnosis when they did your ultrasound and you're having a second trimester marriage miscarriage right now, which is always a little bit worse without getting into the medical details of it but it's because it's, it's later riskier. right it's later it's riskier right. right it's riskier and it, it's messier let's let's put it at that so i was losing a lot of blood and at first they i was upright again to spare some of the gore but at one point in time i was like a murder scene my husband said i was laying on a floor surrounded by blood they didn't want to move me they finally moved me, they catheterized me awake, then they did a DNC awake. The problem was, well, although we were near Corsica, the ship was encountering what's called gale force winds, sort of like a hurricane at sea. The boat and the portholes were bobbing up and down 20 feet. And the captain advised the ship's physician that he couldn't dock the ship. If he did, they would endanger the lives of all the passengers. And while they were quite certain I wasn't going to make it through the night and how horrible it was for my husband and for myself, that was something that they had to do to be responsible stewards of the balance of the passengers, which my husband understood. I just knew I wasn't in a good way. Oh, what was happening? Were you lucid? Were you hallucinating? Uh, were you in pain? Were you, what was going on for you? A lot. They were, <laughs> checking my, they were checking my blood on a regular basis. They were doing fin- finger pricks to understand how much blood I had lost. They explained to us that they had no plasma on the ship and that the best they could do, again, people who are medically trained will understand this, but they put very large needles into my legs and it was meant to plant my uterus and to stop it from bleeding. I, those are very painful. I wouldn't want to ever wish those upon my worst enemy. And then I subsequently had another DNC while awake on the ship. They told my husband they weren't able to put me out because they weren't sure that I'd be able to withstand that. So I had this procedure awake. And the intent was really to stop me from bleeding as the boat sailed towards Civitavecchia, which is the port for Rome. And then I was immediately whisked off the ship and had another DNC in Civitavecchia in Rome. But they confirmed at that point in time that I had something called a missed miscarriage where the baby dies, but the placenta still grows and the body thinks you're still pregnant, which is why smell still bothered me. I had many of this, the scents, if you will. I also experienced what I think was... I wouldn't call it a white light. My husband to this day sort of asked me, what was it? And I'm not able to articulate it, but I was kind of like enough. I was there, but I wasn't there. It's the only way I can explain it. All could state, like almost the end. I don't know. Someone smarter than me about where you go during those phases can explain it. And maybe it was just a loss of blood. But at any event, we had a young child, our son, Matthew. And my biggest worry was, again, married to a European who... You're married for life. And I was worried, we were high school sweethearts, that he would sort of go on with the rest of his life, not remarrying. So there I was in the bed, conscious enough to say, get remarried. I sort of wanted to release him of his marital bounds. Which is, I have to just stop you because it, (laughs) no, just that here you are literally fighting for your life. You're bleeding to death, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you have the lucid, moment to release your husband to make sure that he gets remarried so that he has a partner and your son has a mother yeah it just, I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling to me <laughs> I guess it's just the way I roll so I I remember that moment very clearly and looking up at him and saying you know I want you to get remarried and I also went on to say I want Matthew to have a mummy uh, sorry, getting emotional. Yeah, no, me too. I can feel yeah. myself. Getting- <laughs> so we, I, I equally remember him, perhaps in a non-politic way, not being able to say "I love you" and "Okay" or "I love you" and "No." His answer to that was "Shut up, shut up, just shut up," which is his way of saying you're not giving up on me and absolutely not kind of thing. So 
after that, I don't remember anything. I woke up at eight o'clock the next morning, kind of surprised to be awake, truthfully surprised to be alive. I, at that point, whisked off the cruise ship with all 3,000 passengers sort of staring, trying to figure out what the heck is going on, because they held them up getting off the boat in Italy until I got off. Going into an ambulance, having another surgery in Italy, which is an, you need another podcast for that. But I didn't have a bag packed. I wasn't preparing to go. And at that point in time, they evict you, if you will, from the ship. And I don't mean it in a bad way, but you're no longer a passenger. You're getting off. You're going right, to right. Surgery. See you later. So my husband had to deal with all of that. He's not a planner. I usually plan our vacation. So quite a bit landed on his lap. And then, as I said, I had a second surgery in Italy, woke up in a room where there was four of us, not the best circumstance. The other people beside me either had had hysterectomies or miscarriage, a lot of crying in a language that I didn't understand. And I wanted to get out of there. I was on a different time zone. I believed in my mind that I was fine. Again, the one foot in front of the other, I'm fine. Just let me out of here kind of thing. So um, an interesting 48 hours. So how long were you in Italy? When were you able to fly home? Well, again, interesting in that my belief is I'm alive. God gave me a second lease in life. We flew all the way over here. My husband had never been to Italy. We're not going home. We're going to get back on that boat. You turned the trip. <laughs> so... My husband was a little bit upset, truth be told. Our translator, Angelo, helped us pay the $10,000 bill that we had to pay the hospital in order for them to get me out of there. Paid the bill, ordered a cab, which ended up being a van. I sat in the van because I was too weak to move and insisted that my husband go to the Parthenon. I'd already seen it, but I was like, you have to go. So he begrudgingly walked around the Parthenon, angry, spitting nails, but he went And then he got back into the cab and I said to the cab driver, okay, take us to Florence. We had missed the port of Genoa. The boat had already sailed on when I was having my surgery, but I learned it was in Florence. And I said, off to Florence we go. And we ended up back at the port. The the doctor looked like he saw a ghost when I started walking back onto the boat and the two nurses. Needless to say, we were invited to the captain's table for dinner Back then, the way cruises work, they don't work that way anymore. But back then, you sat with the same people all the time. So we had missed a couple nights dinner. And when we showed up the third night for the dinner, they're like, woohoo, have you been on your honeymoon? Like, who in your cabin having a grand old time? So when we proceeded to tell them why we hadn't been there, like, suffice it to say, all of their mouths were were open. But And I just, I have to ask, I know listeners have got to be wondering, like, physically, you weren't weak, you weren't like, after this. Oh, yeah, no, I was horribly weak. And then there were some challenges on the balance of the cruise. They gave me palifer, which is an iron pill. I had lost quite a bit of blood. And I was exceptionally weak, exceptionally dizzy. But I just kind of, again, this is the mantra I've had my whole life, right? Life deals you situations and then you you choose. You choose to either crumble and sort of have them knock you down or you say, okay, I'm going to pick myself up and I'm going to put one foot in front of the other. And my dad, who's 95 right now, who lives with dementia, my husband often says I have his mannerisms and I've come to believe I have a philosophy that he lives by the glass is either half empty or half full. Mm -hmm. And I choose half full as much as I can. So in that moment, it was half full. But when we got to Spain and Barcelona, there's a very famous church there that they've been building for hundreds of years that has turrets. And I decided I was going to go up it, which was a mistake because I was so weak that I ended up sort of stuck in the turret. (laughs) But, But I got out and we finished the trip. And we came home and I got to embrace my young son and I was alive. We had some massive medical bills. They weren't covered by insurance because it was considered considered a pre-existing condition because the baby had died before we left. But to this day, I still love Italy. It is a place where I came back to life and my husband's not so fond of it for the memories that are different for him, but it, it was all in around a great trip in that I lived. I also, I'm Italian and I, my husband and I went to Italy on our honeymoon in Florence was one of my favorite places. It's beautiful country. Let me ask you something though, Gabby, did you, so I I love your philosophy on life and I got that feeling from you and here, you know, and you're a very successful entrepreneur. My question is though, 
did you allow yourself to grieve that second miscarriage or did you really just keep on keeping on the way you did after the first? Yeah. So the answer is no. Uh, it's probably a weakness that I have in terms of really being able to do that internal, I don't know what you call, just letting myself feel what I need to feel. If I were to sort of diagnose myself, although it's not a clinical diagnosis, I'd probably say that that's a shortcoming. Once again, I just said, I want a baby. I want another baby. Let's get pregnant again. So um went to see a fertility specialist. They did a bunch of tests to try and understand why I'm having these miscarriages. They said, your uterine wall is thick enough. We don't know. Just keep trying. So I got it's, pregnant again. And how and, long are we talking? Was it another year? Yeah, about that. Because, well, my son, there's four years between my son and my daughter. So maybe two years. And then we got pregnant, sick as a dog again, didn't care. I love being pregnant, kept a journal for both my kids. And it was beautiful. I was able to write how much I wanted the child. I have the stories written down of everything for both kids. And then she, I remember I was quite overweight, had food cravings for both and particularly with her kept eating. So I wasn't slender. Let me tell you that. But the day I had her, it was a Sunday. And I said to my husband, I think I'm having this child. And sure enough, we went to the hospital at noon. At two o'clock, she was born. No drugs, no anything. I was standing in the hospital saying, this baby is coming out. I think I need a bed. And very quickly, she arrived. The first thing, my husband, who is Portuguese, non-Asian, said she looks Chinese. So that was a confusing to me I couldn't see her obviously it was a natural birth and very quickly they whisked her away and they when you have a child with down syndrome I've subsequently learned there are certain signs so they have what's called a simian crease they have one line on their hand not two the laugh lines and the lifeline that we have most kids with downs have one line Interesting. Uh, yeah short stunted necks thick at the back uh, do look Asian so there's a number of markers that will give um nurse practitioners and physicians an indication that child has downs. And our daughter presented with all of them except the semi increase. The hospital that where I gave birth, which was terrific, by the way, they had had a lawsuit because I guess they had a misdiagnosis of a child that they said had a particular disability, which didn't turn out to be the case. And so subsequent to that, they were very reticent to ever tell you on the spot your child has something. Uh, they wanted to go through the full physical assessment. So they proceeded, wheeled me off, took her, put her in an incubator. All they told us was that she had fluid on her lungs. She was also quite jaundiced. And so we just assumed, okay, you know, they're taking her to suction out her lungs and, and get away the jaundice. And so my husband went out to buy cigars to celebrate her birth. We named her Hope, by the way, my husband named her which is sort of serendipitous and very truthfully where that name came from. As you mentioned, we were high school sweethearts. And when we first got married, there was a soap opera called Days of Our Lives. I remember and, that soap opera. Right. <laughs> and, and Hope was one of the characters. Yes. And we always liked her and liked the love story between Hope and Bo, which we could totally relate to as high school sweethearts and all the drama that came with their relationship. So at any event, I named our son Matthew, which means gift from God. And my husband, when she was born, I said, okay, you get to the second child. And he immediately said hope. And we didn't know at the time. she. I was going to say that was before you knew she had that. Yeah, we didn't know. We didn't know. So anyway, he went out to buy cigars. I get brought into the room to recover. The physician comes in and says, we think your daughter has Down syndrome. Obviously, that's like hitting you upside the head with bricks. And my answer was okay. And then the I was the first thing I said to him was, Do you have a book? And do you have a book in the hospital library about Down syndrome? And again, my way of dealing with things, and it's always been my way, is the information is power, knowledge is power. So so, so you never, I just have to slow you down again. So when you got the diagnosis, there was no, there was no skipping a beat. There was no crying. There was no, um, I maybe I cried, but if I did, it was like brief. very brief. I think it was more just, okay, this is now my reality. This is her reality. This is our reality. How am I going to make the best of this for everybody, particularly her, but also for us. Right. And so they went off to find the book. My husband's out buying cigars. He came back. And I think the hardest thing was having to tell him 
because I'm not a clinician. I just had a baby. And I just said, they think she has Down syndrome. Obviously, again, my long pause, right? I think the best way to say our reaction, my reaction and my husband's reaction is just a long pause because you're absorbing that information, right? And he equally, no crying, no why us, no stamping his feet. He's just that kind of guy. Very, very stoic. I'm sure inside, right? There was the wow, but he wasn't going to show that outwardly to me. So the the hardest part about it, quite truthfully, is my sister-in-law, his sister, who was pregnant. Her daughter is a little bit younger than ours. I didn't want to tell her about a Down syndrome pregnancy while she's pregnant, right? Course, so, right, yes. Yeah, so I was also having to tell my husband and her company, which has been uncomfortable. But anyway, the, the, the doctor brought the book. He was a cardiologist at the hospital. Many kids with Down syndrome are born with holes in their heart or cardiac issues. So that was the other thing to make sure that her heart was okay. They came back, said, we need to do genetic test. You won't find out for a couple of days. It was the weekend. We need to get the results back. But we think that's the diagnosis. So in the meantime, I took the book. My husband went home. We had a child, our son, that he needed to care for. Mm -hmm. And I basically, I, I do remember this very well. I divided my daughter's life into three parts. So immediately what we needed to do in order for her care, the questions that I had, uh, what I would call sort of the the adolescent, the baby years, the toddler years. So again, what did I need to watch for? What sort of tests did I need to do? And then the adult years, what were the things that I needed to plan for and think about and do now in order to make sure that she was sort of equipped for success later on? Obviously, we'd get to those later, but nonetheless, I sort of parsed my actions, if you will, into those three things. So I asked the doctor when he came in the next day, I asked him about, I remember this like it was yesterday, malabsorption of nutrients, the fact that they can have plaque on their brain because of free radicals. Is there any vitamins that I should be putting her on right out of birth to help prevent some of that? Like tons of questions, likelihood of having leukemia is higher in Down syndrome. How do I know? What do I watch for? So the next day they brought in the psychologist. <laughs> Uh, a guy by the name of Anthony, because when people give birth to special needs kids, I think one of their concerns is them abusing them and not being able to handle it. Marriage is falling apart. All, all quite normal and to be expected. And, and grief, uh, quite frankly, and grief, right? I mean, yeah. just coming to terms with this because it is, it has literally changed your life forever. I understand having children do that anyway, but having a special needs child is a forever kind of Thing. And I don't mean to say that being a parent isn't a forever kind of thing. It's just different. And you don't know what that's going to look like. Yeah, and the burden. I mean, there's, All of there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions. So anyway, Anthony, I, I again, there's certain things that are sort of seared in your memory. And you, you feel like you're reliving them in the moment. And as I'm telling you, I can literally see him across from me at the end of my bed, leaning against the window with this little clipboard in hand. And I said, Anthony, I'm not sure what questions you have on your clipboard, I said, but if any of them are around our ability to care for her stability of marriage, you know, my mental health, any of those things, I just said, get to the bottom of it, where it says this child will be fine, the mother will be fine, I will sign it, you can sign it, and you can go on to the next patient, we are good here. And there was like this long pause, he left. And I subsequently learned from my cousin, who's a nurse in the same hospital setting she's like boy you look quite an impression with him but yeah that was just the way we rolled off we went she wore the same little jumper that my son wore when he was born out of the hospital and the rest as they say is history and we've done exactly that we've followed the kind of plan we've always been very proactive with everything related to her and you know we've had our share of challenges she's had surgeries she's partially deaf she wears bilateral hearing aids we worry about her learning her ability to hear. And so we've taught her sign language. She teaches us sign language now. There's lots we've done to sort of get ahead of the curve. I'd like to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this ad. Hey guys, I wanna take a minute to offer an opportunity for those of you who've been searching for a mental health therapist and haven't had any luck getting callbacks. I know it's challenging to find help, so I've partnered with BetterHelp. They are the world's largest therapy service and they are 100% online. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide 
range of issues. To get started, you just answer a few questions about your needs and preferences in therapy. That way, BetterHelp can match you with the right therapist from their network. Then you can talk to your therapist however you feel comfortable, whether it's via text, chat, phone, or video call. You can message a therapist at any time and schedule live sessions when it's convenient for you. If your therapist isn't the right fit for any reason, you can switch to a new therapist at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you get the same professionalism and quality you'd expect from in-office therapy, but with a therapist who is custom-picked for you, more scheduling flexibility at a more affordable price. Get 10% off right now on your first month at betterhelp.com forward slash rock your shine. That's better H E L P dot com forward slash rock your shine. Now back to our episode. What has she taught you? What have you learned from this? child in this experience I know that it's probably what have we not learned yeah exactly that's and also your son Matthew I bet they are for some I get this this feeling that they are really close and they close yeah yeah yeah, very much so I also think we were just lucky that Matthew came first he's a very deep soul wise beyond his years dry humor Unlike me, I'm very chatty, if you haven't figured that out. He's not. He's more like his father, thinks much more than he speaks, gives you giant bear hugs. He's just a very, very deep, emotive, loving, stable force. Great big brother. She adores him. He adores her. He makes a lot of time for him in his life. So yeah, we've been very, very fortunate in that regard. To answer your question, how has she changed us? I, I really and truly mean you could not say she hasn't changed us. Like she's changed us in every way. I will tell you this, that I think she's maybe a month old. And my mom, who was my best friend throughout my entire life, called me one day. And sorry, I'm just gathering myself. My mom called okay, me. Okay, I can feel yeah. it. I'm going to start to cry again too. <laughs> yeah. So my mom called me and she said, okay. You, you've had your daughter for a month. You haven't cried. You haven't complained. You haven't said, woe is me. What's really going on? But she wanted to understand, is this just some brave front that you've kind of put on? And I'm going to be the one to get to the bottom of this kind of thing. So I explained it to her this way. And I should mention that we are Roman Catholic. My mom grew up in a convent. She's incredibly, was incredibly religious and which is part of the reason why she was able to, I don't think like her diagnosis, but sort of accept it, if you will. So I, I explained it to her this way. And again, for those of you who have any faith, whatever that faith is, you'll, you'll get it. So I said, mom, for me personally, abortion was not ever an issue. And, and this is not a commentary on other people's choices. I'm speaking just about my life here. It's personal. I hear that. Uh, and so I said, for me, abortion wasn't an issue. And had I had one every day that I woke up, I would have had a sense of guilt and a sense of what could have been. And I said, so I know for certain that there would have been sadness every single day. I would have invited sadness into my life. I said, so the flip side to look at that is, any day that I smile with hope or find joy with hope, I'm ahead of the game. And I said, I was happy through my entire pregnancy. I've already found joy in the last month. And for the rest of my life, every time I find joy with her, I'm ahead of the game. So don't worry about me. Don't worry about her. We're good. And how did she receive that, your mom? She was good. She didn't ever have to ask me again. And fell madly in love with hope. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Everybody does. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. No, she is a force. So my husband calls Hope the Force. That is her nickname. Uh, She is known as the Force. She is a mix of my outgoing personality. Even if she's not verbal, she finds a way to communicate. Not overly verbal. She's verbal now, just not overly. Um, She finds a way to communicate herself. She makes her presence known. She is an artist. She loves to paint. She loves to sing, although it's incredibly off tune and very loud with her hearing aids. Just like me. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I know. To know her is to love her. And we've heard that from every single person who encounters her. She, She really just is this tremendous, I don't know, orb of joy. 
Yeah, I I have a dear friend that has, she's not Downs, but she's a very high needs, special needs child. And they live next door. And this child just brings so much joy to our life. She brings joy to the whole neighborhood. Everybody knows Chloe. Everybody knows Chloe. And she's just the spark of, yeah, of light. That's exactly how it feels when we're around her. Yeah. And and again, it hasn't been without its challenges because anybody who has a special needs child would know, although there is joy, let me let me assure you, you know, we had behavioral therapists. There was times when you would say the word bath and hope would throw herself on the floor. And she was just large enough that I could no longer pick her up. And I actually ripped two discs when I picked up my son. So I I had a hard time sort of in some ways handling her. I'm not a hitter. I don't believe in hitting. I'm not a yeller. And so trying to find the right way to deal with a child that has cognitive differences and is behaving badly was wasn't easy. How so did there, you do it? How did you do we, it? We had a behavioral therapist. I, I called somebody. I said, I need help. This is beyond my ability to be able to manage. I don't know what I'm doing. Also, just even transitions. So I mentioned the, the stages that we did. So the first things I did is I took hope to a naturopath. I had her assessed. He was the one who actually did a test on her ankle and said there's a problem with her ears well before she was diagnosed as being deaf through the naturopath. She was maybe nine months old. Put her on a series of vitamins, again, because a lot of kids who have Downs have something called malabsorption of nutrients. They don't absorb nutrients from food the same way we do. So that's kind of step one, which I did right away after she was born. I also noticed we had a sheep dog and having had an older son, whenever our dog would bark, our son would turn. My head would turn. Hope didn't really turn her head much. So that's when it triggered in me that there was a problem. So we took her, she was diagnosed with having bilateral hearing loss, and she subsequently had a number of surgeries at one of the best hospitals in the world, sick kids in Toronto. They also took out her adenoids, her tonsils. They rebuilt one of her ears, actually drilled the base of her spain, the base of her brain, and they rebuilt her ear. It was amazing. And so she had a disease called the cholesteatoma. They subsequently rectified that. And uh, she's back now wearing hearing aids and we watch for it, but she's healthy. But, you know, we did all of those things, but the behavior was definitely a problem, including what's called multi-step instructions. So something as simple as we're going outside, put on your shoes and put on your coat. A lot of kids with intellectual disabilities need what's called prompting. We also use pick symbols, they're visual learners. So there was a lot of things that were done. I worked very closely with every teacher, every school board to develop a program for her that would set her up for success and to help them understand what I would also try and do quite truthfully set boundaries with the teachers to say, if you push hope, she will meet you with equal force. You will not be successful. These are the ways to be able to manage her. So having very honest and candid conversations with educators allowed for hope to be successful and for me to feel as though I was arming them with the tools to be successful with her in school because they didn't know her the way that I knew her and um, always had an exceptional rapport. And I think taking the time to do all of that and developing very careful what's called an IEP, an individual education plan with the teachers, it can be difficult because sometimes as a parent, you want to advocate, but you can cross that line where you become that parent and the teachers no longer want to work with you because you're, you're aggravating, you're too much, your expectations are too high. So I always, you know, had to try and find that right line to become friendly with the teachers, but also advocate for my daughter. And we were fortunate. We were able to find that line. And I do remember my husband sometimes. So when we would leave meetings with the school and he would say oh my god they don't know what just hit them (laughs) (laughs) I was always an advocate let's let's put it that way right I went in with a plan I had an agenda I would listen but I I knew what I wanted and I was able to sort of get that for her and what are the long-term plans for hope will she remain with you guys will you find a group home is the you know what I'm talking about when I when I talk about a group home what are what have you I mean she's 22 years old now is she still with you at home you and your husband oh yeah absolutely so again I think the culture plays a big part of it so my husband being European and the fact that we have the means Uh, Our plan is to keep hope with us for as long as we can. But in that planning process that I mentioned, part of it is also financial planning, life Mm -hmm. planning, will planning. 
But we went through the process and we are now the legal guardians of our daughter. And we have our son as the legal guardian already in the case of our death. So we didn't want our son, although they are incredibly close. It was my choice to have hope. It was my husband's choice to have hope. And in fact, I didn't even tell my husband that I denied the genetic testing because we're married, we're Catholic, and I did it. So it wasn't my son's choice to have a sister with Down syndrome. And while he's been terrific, I have to also as a parent be very accountable to his life and let him have his life and put a a mechanism in place where he can be in his life, but he's not burdened by her, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, just the forethought that you've put into this. I mean, I, 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 I am sure that there are listeners hearing this that will be able to pass this on. I mean, there is just a wealth of information that you are passing on right now. And I want to say thank you for that, because I think that there are so many things that parents don't know about, and it's extraordinarily overwhelming. And I was telling you about my friend who has her special needs child and what she's had to go through. She is an incredible advocate like yourself and has set her child up, but there are So many people, I think, that don't have the resources, they do not have, they do not even know where to begin um, Mm -hmm. in, you know, in in setting some of these things up for long-term success for their children. So thank you for all of the information that you are, that you are giving to us. Well, thank you for the platform. I'll be honest, when Hope was born, one of the things that I said to myself was, I'm going to spend as much time and energy as I can helping to change the system. I think it it was, it sucked in a word, the fact that the physician told me that I had a Down syndrome child without my husband there, that that itself is broken. If you talk about, yeah, if you talk about somebody's mental health, a woman who's just had a baby, and then you go and tell her herself purely because you're on your rounds, you're going to be leaving, and it's just time to deliver the news, right? So there are many things that are broken in the system. I also think just even understanding, you know, an IEP process and and the education for your children or where to go from a behavior standpoint, or, you know, how do you deal with it if your spouse and yourself have a different philosophy on how to how to raise a neurologically divergent child, right? There's so many different things that you have to think about. So thank you for the opportunity. I think there's many people smarter than I who who can help those parents, but I encourage them to to leverage every resource possible. Where would you, you know, for parents really who may feel at a deep loss, where where would you encourage them to even begin? That's a tough one for me because again, everything in my life is always driven by my faith. So I think I can't tell somebody will have faith. You either have faith or you don't. Yeah. But if you don't have faith, maybe you can try and cultivate something that you believe in, whatever that is, right? And, and find purpose in your life and decide, as I said, to have the, the glass half full. You asked my dad, so we, we speak every night before I go to bed. And me too, my dad and I do too. Yeah. So, and if you ask my father, how are you? It's, it's a bit of a joke because you already know the answer he's going to say. And he always says, as well as the Lord will allow. So he's very accepting of whatever life brings right so I guess in that respect as I said earlier I'm a lot like him and I think I was thinking more in the terms of like information like where you know when I think about starting at ground zero I mean because there's so many components there's there there's there you know there's the educational system which is very right. dense as you know right there's their physical health there's the financial planning that you need to think about there are just so many pieces just all the different things that you have discussed there are so many pieces to think about and tackle one at a time when you have a special needs child okay so on that front I think in terms of as I did when Hope was born literally in the hospital you have to plan certain things and then certain things are just going to happen and you have to react So I would say the first thing you have to decide is what are the things that really, really, truly matter to you? Boil them down to the things that matter most. So for me, one of the things that mattered most, in no particular order, was having a say in my daughter's life. And it would drive me absolutely crazy if if the legal system could tell me my daughter's choices in life as opposed to, to me. Right. 
there was no way in hell that that was going to happen. So that was on a must do list, right? Figure out a way to to get guardianship of my daughter, as expensive as it was. Which is so crazy to me to think that this is, it's just, it's, it's beyond my actual understanding. Unless a parent was being abusive to their child, I do not understand how you have to go and pay to get guardianship over your special needs daughter. Like it, it really doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't. And to be honest with you, most of the people, so our daughter does what's called special Olympics bowling. And yeah. so I was asking other parents. So the other thing I was going to say is, you know, speak to other people, speak to people in your community, find a community of people. I wouldn't say we're particularly friendly with them and we're not overly engaged in the community. We go to bowling, we go to sports, we see them, we talk to them, but they're not our everyday network, if you will. For some people, they are. And you have to find also your comfort level in the network. We were asked to be introduced to a group of grieving parents. Hope was maybe, I don't know, a couple months old. And we went to this group that won't be named, but in our region, there's a health group. And the health group said, come to this group. It's it's other parents with kids that have special needs. So I remember there was a dad there who had a dog with Down syndrome. There was an Asian woman who had a autistic son. There was a bunch of different families, all who had kids that were relative newborns. And everybody was going through, I think, just the transition of welcoming these children into their lives and everything that came with it. And some were really, really, really struggling, like in a very bad way. And this one father who was Slavic, who had the Down syndrome child, who was being G-tube fed, which is you put a tube into the baby, they're not able to sort of eat or nurse. And he was beside himself. And he was like, my life is ruined. And my life's wife is ruined. And this is the worst thing that could have ever happened to us. And the Asian woman who was there mentioned that there was, it was like a cultural curse. And in her, in her culture to have a child with special needs was, was not a good thing. And her husband was really having a very difficult time accepting of the diagnosis. And at the end of the day, I'll be honest with you, my husband and I decided to leave the group. We said that it wasn't serving us. It may have been serving the other people, but it wasn't serving us. That's so the feeling you, I was getting when you were talking. I'm like, yeah, it was just, we went there. You weren't like, there. You were in a very yeah. different place. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think you have to find people who, you know, will help you in your journey, certainly make you think differently and challenge you and open up your mind. But you want to leave there, even if you feel, geez, man, they really shared with me a lot of stuff that scares me because I have to do so much. You may feel overwhelmed, but you always want to feel empowered at the end of it, right? And we left those meetings thinking, wow, this is not helping us. So we opted out. So I would say find find an environment that, that does rock your shine, if you will, right? So those were, would be some of the things I would do. And also just be very mindful that when you are advocating for your child, be very self-aware of how you are coming across and be very self-aware if you cross that line of no longer being what I would call a welcome advocate, an annoyance, because it's hard to walk that back. Teachers do talk in the staff room, principals do speak with themselves and you become that parent. So you just always have to be very, very aware and and I love what you said. I want to just, and I'm seeing that we're coming to the top of the hour, but I could talk to you for hours. I think something you said that was really poignant and powerful, and I want to, I, I want to pause this idea of where we go to get help. And is it resonating with us spiritually? If we are spiritual, religious, whatever people's beliefs are, Does it resonate with us with where we just are emotionally? Because in any kind of grief work, there are people go see therapists, people go to grief and loss groups. And if if you are leaving there feeling worse than when you arrived, really sit with yourself and ask yourself, is this really what I need or do I need something different? And that's that, you know, I call our intuition when we are quiet with ourselves. it is our true north. It never fails us, but it is so important to get in touch with that because people, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an opinion of what we need. (laughs) You know, I mean, when we are suffering, when things happen, people tell us what we should and should not do. And, and I, so I really love and appreciate what you just said, because if you do not feel empowered 
and you and and you are feeling worse than you did if you're feeling worse when you leave than when you got there then really rethink yeah about. i'm just i I've, I've learned i'm not a public grief person even when my mother yeah. passed from als recently the hospice where she was they have a sort of follow up and i received a call from one of the grief counselors asking if i wanted to join a grief support group and i said maybe it's just because i'm not in the space right now, but I'm not sure that I ever will be. And it, it's not that going to one is bad. It's just not for me. It's not for everyone. Right. I ran grief groups for a long time. It's not for everyone. And if it, you know, we don't need to pathologize grief. You're sad when somebody in your life that you love dies. It, right. It's sad. It is very, very sad. And what I encourage people is to stay in touch with themselves and realize if you get to a point where you need outside support, you know, mm-hmm. is your is your deep grief turning into complex or long term depression? Are you locking yourself in your room and not, you know, in disengaging from life? You know, and, and I say this to my listeners, if they have friends or family, pay attention to those kinds of things. There's lots of people who grieve that do not need outside support. And there are also people that do. After my brother died. I realized I needed help and I saw a grief counselor for a year. I couldn't do it on my own. And, and, you, you know, and, and like you, I am also, even though I, even though I did grief groups, I am also not one to go to a group and that's just not my venue. So anyway, so thank you for saying that. I do want to though, before I have two questions I always end with, but before I get there, I want to talk about your mother for a moment because that was a very recent loss. And Mm -hmm. I feel like this entire conversation has been about how you really are one of those human beings that takes life as it comes. Mm -hmm. You've got a deep faith that carries you through your life. And clearly you are going through a deep loss over your mother. So how do you deal with grief? Is it? That's a tough one. Yeah. I don't know that I'm dealing with it. Truthfully, as I speak to you before my mom passed, I painted her hands on a canvas so that I could touch them. So I'm looking at that right now. I, my son and I painted her hands and I asked her when she was dying if we could put her hands in the paint and she nodded. She can speak, but I'm not sure that I'm really dealing with it in that. I haven't come to terms that she's not here. Fair enough. I think I know she's not here. I go to her. My mother was cremated. I go to the wall, the mausoleum. I talk to her, talk to her every day. I think in that instance, it's more just a hang on to the good stuff. Thank you for that. All right. Let's let's wind down. And I have two questions left for you. One is, and I can't wait to hear your response to both of these. But the first <laughs> one is, what does self-love mean to you? What does that look like? A beach. <laughs> I love a good that. book. Yeah. No, no, really. I mean, I love to cook. I love food. I love wine. I love culinary experiences. Self-love for me is just indulging in my passions and doing what I love, even if my husband doesn't love it, like telling him I want to go back to Italy, which gives him, makes the hair on his back rise, but (laughs) because I love the food there and I love the culture. So travel, I mean, self-love for me is really indulging in in travel and life and and food and culinary. I think the other part sometimes is just saying it's okay to not be perfect. I am a perfectionist by nature. I like things to go to plan. I like them to just be exactly as they were in my head and sort of unfold that way. So I think some self-love is oftentimes in the quiet of the night, not the best sleeper, to kind of acknowledge that perfection is the enemy and to just let stuff go. Thank you for that. Finish the sentence. Now, (laughs) it's funny because it's your daughter's name. (laughs) I want you to finish this sentence. Hope is eternal. Oh, I love that. Hope is eternal. That is beautiful. Okay, Gabby, where can people find you? We will also have your links in the show notes. But if somebody wants to find out more about you, what you do, who you are, where can they go? 
uh, LinkedIn. I mean, most people in this world find me that way. That's my professional spot. I'll be honest, my Instagram is locked. That's pri- So your Instagram is private. Okay. Yeah, my Instagram is private. My Facebook is open, but actually, no, it's also locked, to be honest with you. So, so um, LinkedIn is where they work. LinkedIn is really the best place to find me. Okay, and we'll have that link in the show notes, as I said. Is there anything else you would like to say to our listeners that I've not asked you? I can't think of anything, to be honest with you. I appreciate the opportunity and truthfully, thank you for the platform. Thank you for taking the leap to create your podcast. I think you're doing a service to a lot of people and a lot of your listeners are very thankful for that. So kudos to you for being brave enough to grab life and wrestle it to the ground. (laughs) Well, thank you. Well, the show is what it is because of people like you that are willing to come on and share their stories. So thank you. And I want to thank all my listeners. I love you guys. And we'll see you here next week. Bye for now.